Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Reports of a crashed alien craft in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico left many of the general public feeling that the long-awaited proof of extraterrestrial intelligence had come. But hopes were soon dashed, as an earlier statement about a crashed saucer was changed to nothing more than a crashed weather balloon. This proved unbelievable to the public, leaving many suspicious of a government cover-up as there were too many witnesses who claimed to have seen the crashed UFO and alien bodies. Years later, 1954, it's rumored by some that President Dwight D. Eisenhower met with alien beings in person, being whisked away in a hastily arranged trip to see an alien craft and its wreckage. The location for this alleged clandestine meeting was Edwards Air Force Base. Of course, no actual proof exists of this meeting. And then, just a year later, the aliens invaded again, this time on a small farm in Kentucky, where a family was traumatized by their arrival and went to battle against them in order to survive. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Most news reporters would relish the opportunity to cover the story of a flying saucer sighting but one case in 1987 left one radio newsman wishing he had never heard of the letters UFO. A weirdo family member shares her story of some creepy sensations. A vampire stalks a New England family in the 1800s, and now science has identified the name of this monster. A room covered in gold, jewels, and other precious items was created as a gift for Tsar Peter the Great. But what is also great is the mystery about what happened to the room. Weirdo family member Rita Gomez sees a ghostly child in her home. Visitors to a Pakistan flea market are horrified by a creature with eyes like a torch. What could this terror be? Montgomery Gibbs was a wealthy attorney and real estate man, and his murder baffled police even after they had someone confess to shooting him. One was reported as wiry and slightly muscular, and around six feet tall. It might have been humanoid in shape, but there is nothing else human-like about these bizarre entities being encountered in Japan. But first, in 1955, the family of Billy Ray Taylor fought for their lives against alien invaders from another world. We begin with that story. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Only a year after the bizarre case of a UFO disappearing into thin air, another case that stretches the imagination would occur in the rural setting of Kelly Hopkinsville, Kentucky. The events in Kentucky would begin on the night of August 21, 1955, and are still being discussed and debated today. A family would have a battle with a group of small alien creatures. Billy Ray Taylor and his wife were visiting the Sutton farm on this particular night. 
Billy exited the house to go fetch some water from the Sutton family well. While drawing water, he witnessed an immense, shining object landing about a quarter of a mile from the house. Excited and frightened, he ran back to the house with the news, but no one took him very seriously. Soon, strange things began to occur. The family dogs began to bark outside. The man of the house, Lucky, along with Billy Ray, went outside to see what the problem was. They were both stunned when they saw a three- to four-foot-tall creature making its way toward them with its hands up. The two men described the creature as like nothing they had ever seen before. It had large eyes, long, thin mouth, thin, short legs, large ears, and its hand ended with claws. Billy Ray fired his 22 caliber rifle and Lucky fired his shotgun. The barrage of bullets had no effect on the being. Lucky and Billy both knew that they had hit their target at that close a range, but the small creature did a backflip and then scurried into the woods. The two men went back into the house, but soon another creature was seen looking at them through a window. The two men again blasted away and ran outside to see if they had killed it, but found nothing. A large hole was later seen through the screen where the shots had been fired. This cat-and-mouse game continued into the night as the creatures would appear and disappear. Realizing that they were up against something out of the ordinary, the family decided to run from the house and ask for assistance from the police station in the little city of Hopkinsville. It took two vehicles to hold everyone, but off they went. After hearing their bizarre story, Sheriff Russell Greenwell thought they were joking. Finally, the family convinced him that they were not making up their story, and Greenwell decided to go to the Sutton farmhouse. When the police arrived at the farmhouse and searched the area around the house, no evidence of any creatures was found. However, they did find numerous bullet holes through the windows and walls of the house. Over 20 policemen were involved in the search. The police admitted that the Suttons were not drunk and genuinely frightened by something or someone. Nearby neighbors did confirm strange lights in the sky and hearing of bullets being fired. The police left at 2.15 a.m. After the police were gone, the aliens returned and the earlier battle was repeated. The gunfire had no effect on the creatures. Altogether, 11 people were present at the Sutton family farmhouse. Not all of the 11 witnessed the strange events of the night. June Taylor was too frightened to look, and Lonnie Lankford and his brother and sister were hidden during the encounter, which still left seven witnesses to the encounter. The police department requested the Air Force to investigate the happenings at the Sutton house. They also did a search of the house and the surrounding area, but without any solid evidence being found. The morning of the Air Force search, Lucky and Billy Ray had gone to Evansville, Indiana on family business. The five remaining witnesses to the events of the night before were interviewed by Air Force personnel, giving their full account of the Night of Terror. The story of the small aliens spread quickly, and the Kentucky New Era newspaper published a story of the family's encounter on August 22, 1955. In the beginning, most of the public believed the Suttons were perpetrating a hoax, but if this was the case, what would be their reason? They made no money from the story, only accruing debt by damaging their house. Could all of their troubles have been to get their name in the local newspaper? All of the witnesses to the strange events of the night of August 21, 1955 made sketches of what the creatures looked like. The drawings were practically identical. Almost a year later, the case was investigated by Isabel Davis. She believed that the Suttons were telling the truth. Famed UFO investigator Dr. J. Allen Hynek also believed the account of the Kelly aliens and discussed the case with Davis. The case is still being investigated even today, and there have been many books and television specials made relating to the Kentucky events of 1955. Up next, a vampire stalks a New England family in the 1800s, and now science 
has identified the name of this monster. Plus, a room covered in gold, jewels, and other precious items was created as a gift for Tsar Peter the Great, but what is also great is the mystery about what happened to that room. These stories and more when Weird Darkness Returns. Hey Weirdos! Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with Weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night, August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata, this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! been in his grave so long that when his family dug him up to burn his heart, the organ had decomposed and was not there. Desperate to stop him from stalking them, they took his head and limbs and rearranged them on top of his ribs in the design of a skull and crossbones. He was a vampire, after all, and in rural New England in the early 1800s, this was how you dealt with them. When they were finished, they reburied him in his stone-lined grave and replaced the wooden coffin lid on which someone had used brass tacks to form the inscription JB55 for his initials and his age. Now, 200 years or so after the death of what's now the country's best-studied vampire, DNA sleuths have tracked down his probable name, John Barber. He was probably a hard-working farmer. Missing his top front teeth, he was no neckbiter. He had a broken collarbone that hadn't healed right, an arthritic knee that probably made him limp, and he had died an awful death, probably from tuberculosis, which was so bad it had scarred his ribs. The latest findings in a case that started in 1990 when his coffin was discovered in a gravel quarry in Griswold, Connecticut, are contained in a new report by, among others, experts at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System's DNA Laboratory in Dover, Delaware. The report was summarized in a presentation on July 23rd at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Silver Spring, Maryland, which aided the study and where the remains are held. The case is unusual because Barber may be the country's only supposed vampire whose bones have been studied by scientists. This case has been a mystery since the 1990s, Sharla Marshall said in an email. Marshall is a forensic scientist with SNA International in Alexandria, Virginia, who worked on the project. Now that we've expanded technological capabilities, we wanted to revisit JB55 to see whether we could solve the mystery of who he was. It's the latest chapter in a project that has cast light on the eerie vampire scare in New England. Connecticut and Rhode Island especially, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, and its connection to the spread of tuberculosis, or consumption as it was called at the time. The highly contagious disease was so wasting and terrifying that those who died of it were believed to leave their graves, infecting relatives and draining away blood and life, scholars have said. These attacks 
were more mysterious and less graphic than those of the blood-sucking vampires of gothic fiction. This was not bats flying through the night, said Nicholas F. Bellantoni, the retired Connecticut state archaeologist who worked on the case from the start and is one of the report's authors. This is not Bella Lugosi, he said. But the terror they brought was real. Consumption often caused a bloody cough and left victims pale and gaunt, with blood in the corners of their mouths, author and folklorist Michael E. Bell wrote. The emaciated figure strikes one with terror, recounted an 18th-century doctor quoted by Bell in a 2013 essay in the journal Criticos. The forehead covered with drops of sweat, the cheeks a livid crimson, the eyes sunk, the breath offensive, quick, and laborious. The vampire's true menace seemed to come after death, and he had to be killed again during what Bell called therapeutic exhumation. Often the suspected vampire was a family member who had died of the disease and was thought to be infecting sons, daughters, or a spouse. Family members were frequently the ones conducting the exhumation. Bell had documented 80 such cases, mostly in remote areas of New England. This was being done out of fear and out of love, Bellatoni said. People were dying in their families, and they had no way of stopping it, and just maybe this was what could stop the deaths. They didn't want to do this, but they wanted to protect those that were still living. People were desperate, he said. The best method of killing the suspected vampire was to check the exhumed corpse to see if any liquid blood remained in the heart. If so, the deceased was probably a vampire, according to belief. The heart was then removed and burned, with family members sometimes inhaling the smoke to prevent further disease. Similar incidents have long turned up in Europe, where there are many accounts of corpses being dug up, burned, rearranged, decapitated, or having stakes driven through them. In Barber's case, there was probably no heart to burn, Bellantoni and Paul S. Sledzik wrote in 1994, so the bones of the chest were disrupted and the skull and thigh bones were placed in a skull and crossbones position, they wrote. After Barber's grave was discovered, his remains were sent to the museum for study, and a sample from a thigh bone was sent to the DNA lab for analysis. But the technology of 30 years ago yielded scant results. The paper's authors wrote identification was impossible. But when modern tools were used, Y-chromosomal DNA profiling and surname prediction via genealogy data available on the internet, the experts said they came up with a match for the last name, Barber. They then checked old cemetery and newspaper records to see whether any people with the last name of Barber ever lived in Griswold. They discovered a newspaper notice mentioning the death there in 1826 of a 12-year-old boy named Nathan Barber, whose father was John Barber. Researchers had found a grave near J.B.'s containing a coffin with the notation NB-13, similarly tacked on the lid. The project began in November 1990 when an abandoned cemetery was encountered during mining at a sand and gravel facility in Griswold, according to a study by Sledzik, Bellantoni, and colleague David A. Poyer. Human skeletons and crumbling coffin parts emerged from the earth and two human skulls tumbled down an embankment when three boys playing there dislodged them. Investigators eventually removed the remains of 27 people, five men, eight women, and 14 children from 28 graves in what scholars discovered was an old burying ground called the Walton Family Cemetery. One grave contained evidence of a coffin, but no human remains. But it was grave number four that drew the most attention everyone was in good anatomical position except this one individual, J.B. 55. Under his coffin lid, Bellantoni and his colleagues found the strange skull and crossbones arrangement. His thigh bones were uprooted from the anatomical position and crossed over the chest, he said. The chest had been broken into, and the skull was decapitated and moved away, he said. I was totally befuddled. I had no clue what I was looking at. Research soon suggested a link to the New England vampire folk belief, he said. So J.B. turned out to have tuberculosis. Evident because of the lesions on his ribs, he said. 
We do believe that he was rearranged in the grave because he was believed to be an undead. Bellantoni said J.B. had probably been deceased four or five years when he was exhumed, which, based on his recovered coffin hardware, probably happened in the early 1800s. Here in New England, we had large farming families, he said. Because they didn't understand the transmission of the disease, you had family members who were suffering from tuberculosis sitting at the dinner table with the whole family, coughing, and you had tuberculosis victims sleeping in one room with five or six brothers and sisters coughing. It was epidemic, he said. So what now of poor John Barber, the alleged vampire? Listen, Bellantoni said, he was a hard-working farmer, probably lower middle class, you could see it in his bones, you could see it in his arthritic condition of his vertebra. Hard, hard-working. Good Christian man, I'm sure. A stunning work of art made of panels of glowing amber, jewels, and gold, the Amber Room was initially built as a chamber for Queen Sophie Charlotte at her palace in Berlin, Prussia. The meandering history of the Amber Room took it from Berlin to Russia, and then its ultimate fate became a mystery that has never been solved. What makes this treasure so unique and valuable is its primary component, amber, which is the ancient fossilized resin from plants. Samples can range in age from about 15 to 300 million years old. When light shines on amber, the resin has a brilliant translucency that makes it highly valued by artists and collectors. Thus, amber commands a stunning price tag. Perhaps its best known and inspired use was the creation of the Amber Room. The history of the Amber Room goes back to Lietzenburg in Prussia. Lietzenburg was initially the personal summer palace of Sophie Charlotte, who became queen in Prussia in 1701. That same year, she requested that construction should begin on her chamber in her palace. The designer of the room was Andreas Schluter, and the builder was Gottfried Wolfram, an amber craftsman. After Sophie died just four years later, in 1705, her husband, King Frederick, who loved Sophie very much, named her summer palace Charlottenburg Palace in her honor. Even after her death, the king carried out Sophie's vision to build her special chamber. It took more than ten years to complete, but once King Frederick displayed it, everyone thought it to be a stunning masterpiece. The Wikipedia article Amber Room describes the magnificent construction, saying, "...the Amber Room is a priceless piece of art, with extraordinary architectural features such as gilding, carvings, 450-kilogram or 990-pound amber panels, gold leaf, gemstones, and mirrors, all highlighted with candlelight. Additional architectural and design features include statues of angels and children." However, the room built for Queen Sophie was not destined to remain in Prussia. Her son had political ambitions that outweighed his sentimentality for the Amber Chamber. During a visit to Prussia in 1712, Tsar Peter the Great of Russia confided in King Frederick William I, Queen Sophie's son, on how much he adored this stunning room. In order to cement an alliance with Russia against Sweden, King William I presented the Amber Masterpiece as a gift to Tsar Peter the Great. William shipped the gift over water to St. Petersburg, Russia in 18 large boxes in 1716. Once in St. Petersburg, the Tsar began renovations and added onto the room even more. It measured 55 meters with over six tons of amber in its final form in 1763. It was so majestic that people thought of it as the eighth wonder of the world. The room sat in the Catherine Palace of St. Petersburg, but it was not put on display as it had been at Charlottenburg Palace, and viewing was reserved for very few people. The Amber Chamber remained in St. Petersburg until 1941. In that year, Germany invaded the Soviet Union in Operation Barbosa. 
The Nazi acquisition of all art and treasure was a high priority, and they plundered everything they could get their hands on. Naturally, the Amber Chamber was a paramount target, and the Nazis aimed to take it back to German soil. When Leningrad, formerly St. Petersburg until 1914, was about to fall to the German forces during the invasion, the Russians tried to move the chamber to a safe location. However, because the dried and fragile amber crumbled, they instead designed to disguise it by placing wallpaper over the panels to make it look like an ordinary room. The Germans, however, were not fooled. They knew exactly where the room was and they were prepared to transport it. Within 36 hours, the Nazis dismantled the room and placed it inside 27 crates on 18 trucks. Then they transported it to Konigsberg Castle in eastern Prussia. Subsequently, they reassembled it and placed it on exhibition in March 1942. The war did not stay in Germany's favor for long. In August of 1944, Royal Air Force bombers heavily damaged Konigsberg and much of the castle. On April 9, 1945, the Germans surrendered to the Soviets who took siege of Konigsberg and forced the Germans out. They renamed the city Kaliningrad, and today it still belongs to Russia. Although there are numerous theories about the history of the Amber Room, these are a few of the most popular. Nazis disassembled the room again and placed it on crates at a railway station, then they put it aboard the Wilhelm Gustav German military ship which left port on January 30, 1945. The Wilhelm Gustav sunk shortly thereafter by a Soviet submarine, taking the Amber Room with it. Nazis hid it in a basement bunker in Konigsberg. They then sealed it off and it's been inaccessible ever since. Soldiers buried the room in the Ore Mountains. The fire at the Konigsberg Castle destroyed the room during the bombing. And Stalin hid the original room and built a replica that the bamboozled Germans stole. According to a Smithsonian article, A Brief History of the Amber Room, the director of the Konigsberg Castle Museum, Alfred Rode, had studied the room while it was there. In late 1943, with the end of the war in sight, Rode was advised to dismantle the Amber Room and crate it away. Where the Nazis hid it after that is the great mystery. Possibly a witness at the time, Leonid Arenstein, a lieutenant in the Red Army that took siege of Konigsberg in 1945, said that he went to Konigsberg Castle and saw pieces of amber relics. When he asked the museum custodian about them, Arenstein was told that the rest of the panels were boxed up in the basement. Because Arenstein did not understand the significance of the items at the time, he didn't pursue it. Days later, when he attempted to get back to the castle, it had already been engulfed in flames as reported by NBC News in the article Mystery of the Amber Room Resurfaces. In that same NBC article, Avenir Avzyanov, an official on the search and protection of missing art with Kaliningrad's regional government, stated that some portions of the room did burn in the Konigsberg Castle. However, he felt that it's likely the Nazis took away most of it before the Soviets had time to secure the city. Today, he and his team are still searching underneath the ruins of the war for clues to the whereabouts of the amber panels. Pieces of the original room have been found since 1945. The most recent finding was in 1997, when one of the four stone mosaics that went into the decoration of the room was recovered in West Germany. It was in the possession of the son of one of the soldiers who packed it up, but the son claimed that he did not know where it had come from. Recently, in June of 2016, the New York Times published an article regarding possible clues to the location of the amber panels. According to the article, some Polish villagers who were alive in 1945 told the director of the Polish Mamerki Museum, Bartlomiej Plebinczyk, that they saw Germans unload large crates from a convoy of vehicles. They said the Germans put the crates into a secret chamber in a stark, moss-covered Nazi bunker near the Russian border in early 1945. Plebinchik and his team used ground-penetrating radar to scan underneath the bunker, and they found what appeared to be a chamber. The team planned to dig under the bunker, however, they have not yet published any findings. The Soviet Union commenced on the reconstruction of the room using mostly black-and-white photographs in 1979. 
In 2003, the replica was nearly in completion. On the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg, President Vladimir Putin and German Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder unveiled their new amber chamber. Today, the public is able to tour Catherine Palace and view the replica. Queen Sophie Charlotte's vision of her amber chamber manifested into one of the most splendid and coveted treasures of all time. Its mystery is still ablaze with the burning desires of governments, scholars, and treasure hunters to find it. If the room still exists, the fragility of the amber may have turned it into something that scarcely resembles its original opulence that once was the crown jewel of Charlottenburg Palace. Judith Reipma has produced two collections of poems about the amber treasure. This excerpt from Twists and Turns sums it up perfectly. Finding Atlantis has proved much easier, inspired fewer theories, though not as many debates about who should receive the spoils of war. When Weird Darkness returns, weirdo family member Rita Gomez sees a ghostly child in her home. Visitors to a Pakistan flea market are horrified by a creature with eyes like a torch. What could this terror be? Plus, Montgomery Gibbs was a wealthy attorney and real estate man, and his murder baffled police even after they had someone confess to shooting him. These stories are up next. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. It started when I was home alone one day. I was sitting in the TV room, exercising to a cable show, when I saw a small child peeking from around a bedroom door. Even though I knew no one was home, I got up and looked into the room. This bedroom had two doors, so I went to one door, then the other, but no one was there. It kind of bothered me for a while, so the following week I visited my mother and I told her about the incident. My mother told me that my niece, who as a child was killed by a family member by accident in our driveway, would do that all the time. My mom said she believed it was her playing peekaboo with me. So the following week, I actually had a dream of her. The family cemetery where she is buried was different in my dream, but I was there to visit her. 
There were other family members there, but I was a child. I heard a squeaky pinwheel that was making a sound that sounded like a child's cries. I was so concerned, so I called my sister and told her that she had to visit my niece Julie at her grave because she thought that she was being forgotten. I visited the graveyard and cleaned up her area and never experienced anything else from her again. Now I visit the cemetery more often because now my mom and dad are buried there. The Shershaw Flea Market in Pakistan, which is touted by some as the biggest market for scrapped goods in South Asia, has now become a haunted site for some. The sighting of a mysterious, out-of-the-world creature at the market has sparked fear in many traders working there. The traders, as a result, have started closing their shops earlier than before. It all started more than a week ago when a watchman, Gulzar, was performing his duties outside a warehouse. He heard dogs barking nearby and got up from his chair to see what was going on. Gulzar said that he felt a strange sensation as he was walking towards the area where the noise was coming from. He then spotted a strange creature and ran away. The creature was black and its eyes were as bright as a torchlight, he said. Gulzar has been working as a watchman for the last 25 years. He said, I've never seen anything like that before. Gulzar shared his encounter with other watchmen, but no one believed him. The next day, another watchman, Abdul Qayyum, was taking a round of the area when he spotted the same creature. The two watchmen claimed that the creature had even killed 11 goats at the warehouse. Soon, rumors started making the rounds, leading to fear and panic. Some have claimed that the mysterious figure is five feet tall, others claim it can jump up to 20 feet. Not everyone believes the story, though. A person who works at the flea market said that he thinks somebody's probably pulling a prank and there is no truth to the sightings. Some traders even approached the Jahanabad police, asking for them to investigate the matter. A policeman, Muzamul Shah, said they received many reports about sightings of such a figure adding that they are still investigating the matter. Peace was disturbed in a fashionable Buffalo, New York neighborhood on April 18, 1894, by three gunshots fired at 10 p.m. on Delaware Avenue near Bryant Street. Neighbors hurried outside and found a man lying in a carriage driveway between two houses, bleeding from a gunshot wound to the temple and another to the shoulder. He was rushed to General Hospital, where he died three minutes after being admitted. The dead man was later identified as 33-year-old Montgomery Gibbs, a successful attorney and real estate developer. He lived with his brother Clinton on Main Street within walking distance of the murder scene, but no one could explain what he was doing there. Montgomery Gibbs had many acquaintances and belonged to several fraternal organizations, but no one can say that they knew him well. He was a private man. Even his brother Clinton knew nothing of his romantic life or the details of his business dealings. Suicide was ruled out. The wounds, positioned as they were, could not have been self-inflicted, and no pistol was found at the scene. Robbery was considered. Burglars and footpads had been operating in the area, but they were not known to commit murder, and nothing had been stolen. It appeared that Gibbs had been intentionally killed. With no visible clues, the police kept the details of their investigation secret, and the newspapers began investigating on their own. The Buffalo Evening News believed that Gibbs was lured into a trap. They put together a timeline of his movements that night, and he was seen by several people walking leisurely up Delaware as if to keep a 10 o'clock appointment. The news concluded that Gibbs was killed by a woman. The angle of the wound to his temple indicated that it was fired by someone shorter than he was, and a woman's footprint was found in the hedges near the body. 
The police also believed that the killer was a woman but would not elaborate. What was not revealed to the public was that shortly after the murder, the Buffalo Evening News received an anonymous letter purporting to be from the killer. The writer said she was a 17-year-old girl who Gibbs had seduced eight months previous under the promise of marriage. He refused to keep his promise. Pregnant and desperate, she lured him to the spot on Delaware Avenue and shot him. She expressed no remorse and was glad that he would never ruin another innocent girl. The police and the paper were unable to track down the anonymous writer. At the coroner's inquest, the police were forced to admit they had no clue as to who killed Montgomery Gibbs. The jury ruled that he was shot by a person or persons unknown. That was how matters stood until the following October when a young woman in Cleveland, Ohio, confessed to killing Gibbs. The Cleveland police had received a tip that Clarence Robinson, currently in their custody for burglary, had murdered Montgomery Gibbs in Buffalo the previous April and that his wife, Sadie, was also involved. 19-year-old Sadie Robinson told the police that Clarence was innocent of the killing and that she fired the shots that killed Gibbs. The Buffalo police quickly charged Sarah Sadie Robinson as a fugitive from justice and brought her to Buffalo. Once in custody in Buffalo, Sadie said that her confession in Cleveland had been a lie and refused to say anything more. Meanwhile in Cleveland, Clarence Robinson confessed to trying to rob Gibbs at gunpoint on April 28. He said that he fired two shots, but the shot that killed Gibbs was fired by his wife, Sadie. He seemed relieved to finally confess the crime. In Buffalo, both Robinsons were indicted for first-degree murder, and Clarence Robinson was extradited from Cleveland to Buffalo. They now separately confessed, telling virtually identical stories except that Clarence said that Sadie fired the murder shot. Sadie said Clarence fired all the shots. Clarence Robinson, age 23, had spent most of his adult life in prison. After his last prison term, he married Sadie and purchased a minstrel troupe. They traveled with the show, losing money at every stop until they found themselves penniless in Buffalo. Clarence decided to return to robbery, and Sadie joined him, dressed as a man, wearing his trousers and a slouch hat. On Delaware Avenue, they planned to stop a wealthy-looking man and rob him at gunpoint. Clarence thought Montgomery Gibbs was a prime candidate, but Sadie thought he was too big. When Clarence drew his revolver, Gibbs, who was tall and athletically built, grabbed his arm. In the struggle that followed, Clarence's revolver went off twice. Then, according to Clarence, Sadie, who was also armed, fired the third shot. According to Sadie, she stood frozen with fear and watched as Clarence fired the shot that killed Gibbs. Clarence also confessed to writing the anonymous letter to the Buffalo Evening News to try to lead the investigation in the wrong direction. Clarence and Sadie Robinson were tried together in March 1895. They both pled not guilty, recanting their confessions, claiming that they were made under duress with false representations made by the police. The prosecution relied on expert witnesses who asserted the cartridges found at the scene were from a revolver owned by Clarence Robinson and that the handwriting of the anonymous letter matched that of a letter Clarence had sent to Sadie. The defense called Sadie Robinson as a rebuttal witness after Chief of Detectives Cusack testified to the circumstances of her confession. She claimed the police had induced her to implicate Clarence, implying that she could get the reward offered. Aside from Sadie's testimony, the defense offered no evidence, asserting that the prosecution had not proven their case or even proven that the Robinsons had been in Buffalo that night. It was assumed that the jury would find the Robinsons either guilty or not guilty of first-degree murder. But they surprised everyone, including the defense attorney, when they found Clarence Robinson guilty of second-degree murder and Sadie Robinson guilty of manslaughter. They had saved the Robinsons from the electric chair, but Clarence was sentenced to life in prison and Sadie to 20 years. In November of 2015, 
there was a rather odd encounter with some sort of unidentified humanoid just outside the beautiful historic former capital city, Kyoto, known for its numerous traditional temples and ancient shrines. According to Cryptozoology News, 36-year-old teacher Toriki Watanabe had a rather surreal experience as he was driving from Tokyo to Kyoto for his brother's wedding. At around 10 p.m., he claims he stopped at a small roadside shop and stepped inside to have a cigarette before hitting the road again. The surrounding area was said to be forested, and as he had his cigarette and admired the view, he says he noticed something quite odd in the form of a slouched humanoid figure lurking off in the brush around 200 feet away. Whatever it was moved in a distinctly odd way, and as Watanabe looked on, he could begin to make out some of its features and came to the conclusion that this was no person at all. It was described as being wiry and slightly muscular, and around six feet tall with a bent-over posture and covered in gray skin. No clothing was visible, and as it walked it remained hunched over, with its unnaturally long arms dragging along the ground. Although the witness could not see the thing's face clearly, he did notice the strange detail that it seemed to emit a faint yellow or white light coming from behind it, just around its lower back. The startled man called out to it, but it did not respond, and he stared at it as whatever it was meandered off into the forest. Although it's hard to tell what this bizarre entity could have possibly been, Watanabe has his own thought, suggesting it was an actual specimen of a type of folkloric creature known as a shirimi. This creature was said to be a mischievous, impish thing that liked to scare travelers in the region around Kyoto. Very bizarrely, the creature is depicted in folklore as having a huge, glittering eye where its anus should be. And indeed, shirimi literally means buttock's eye. Too bad the witness couldn't see an eye back there, leaving us to speculate as to whether this was an anus-eyed mythical creature, an alien, an interdimensional traveler, or just a weird-looking naked guy running around in the woods. Whatever it was, it is a weird report to be sure. Kyoto has in later years been the location for other similar strange sightings as well. In 2016, a woman living on the outskirts of the city claims that she was startled when she heard her normally quiet dog start barking uncontrollably. Wondering what was going on, she claims to have looked outside to see the animal cowering against a fence, smashing up against it as hard as it could, as if trying to push itself through the barrier and away from something there in the yard with it. When the woman looked to see what it was so afraid of, she was met with the sight of a skinny, gray-skinned creature hunched over the dog's food bowl, apparently eating the contents with relish and ignoring the barks and whines of the dog nearby. She says that the odd creature was humanoid but gray and hairless, very thin and sinewy like a greyhound, and with long arms that ended in tiny clawed hands. At first she could not make out its face as it was concentrating on eating, but then it seemed to sense that it was being watched and whipped its head up to look straight at her in surprise. She would save its face and what happened next thus. It had a small triangular face with huge yellow eyes that took up most of its face and seemed to faintly glow. The ears were small and pointed. As it licked its lips, I could see that it had sharp, jagged teeth. It looked at me for a second with a sort of startled expression, and then it leapt right over the fence in a single bound. What was this being, and why did it want that dog food so much? Who knows? Even more recently is a report from the same city from March of 2018, and it involves an out-of-town tourist who was staying in Kyoto at a place that he'd found on Airbnb. On the evening of March 11th, he claims that he'd been on his way back to his place at around 11.40 p.m. as he passed a darkened shrine there were two bizarre creatures that jumped over the wall right in front of him, seemingly coming from the shrine's courtyard. At first, he thought them to be children, but as he approached, he could see that they were something altogether different. 
The creatures were described as being three to four feet tall, with bodies that were as white as snow, long, thin arms and legs, and heads with pointy ears and large, triangular black eyes. When they saw the witness, the beings seemed startled and began to run away. The witnesses said, they ran with arms behind them. They went behind a corner of a wall. As I walked towards there, one of them looked back at me and made eye contact. I was feeling terrified. I didn't want to get too close. I lost sight of them as they turned a corner. What could these diminutive creatures have been? While the exact origins of these particular creatures are unclear, another strange and rather frightening humanoid report from another area of Japan seems to suggest bizarre creatures which can only be described as aliens. On February 23, 1975, two seven-year-old boys named Masato Kawano and Katsuhiro Yamahata were out roller skating in the early evening hours in Kofu City, Yamanashi Prefecture, where they claimed that they saw in the sky a pair of luminous orange lights that flickered and made a strange ticking sound. As they looked on in amazement, one of the lights apparently moved off toward the distant mountains, while the other started to descend towards the ground nearby. The boys claimed that they went off to investigate and saw the strange craft come down to rest in a small vineyard behind an old abandoned estate. The craft was described as being a domed disc around 15 feet in diameter and 7 feet high, which rested upon three ball-shaped legs. The surface of the strange object was silver-colored and appeared to have characters or letters of some sort etched upon it. The loud ticking sound of the craft was very pronounced as they drew closer, sounding somewhat reminiscent of a Geiger counter. As the two boys pondered what they were seeing, a hatch purportedly opened on the side out of nowhere and a ladder extended towards the ground, after which a strange-looking being climbed out. The creature stood around four feet tall and was wearing a reflective silver suit of some sort. The being's skin was allegedly a dark brown in color, and it was covered with thick wrinkles that were so pronounced as to make most of its facial features indiscernible, save for two pointed ears and prominent and intimidating two-inch-long silver fangs that jutted out from the folds of where its mouth might be. In its hands it held some sort of device whose purpose could not be fathomed but which looked somewhat like a rifle. Another of the creatures could be seen sitting within the craft huddled over some sort of flickering control panel. Whatever it was seemed to have completely ignored the two young boys standing there gawking at it as it proceeded to carefully examine the surrounding terrain. After a few moments of this, it suddenly seemed to become aware of the boys, after which it approached them and patted one of them, Yamahata, twice on the shoulder while issuing a sound that sounded like a tape recorder running backwards. Upon being tapped, Yamahata allegedly slumped to the ground and was unable to move, paralyzed by some inscrutable force. This pushed Kawano into action, and he quickly scooped his friend up onto his shoulders and ran from the area as fast as his legs could carry him. When he got home, Yamahata came too, and they supposedly told their parents what had happened, who would, grudgingly, follow the boys out to the estate outside to see the strange orange light coming up in the sky for themselves. The light would then emit a burst of blinding light and vanish. Later, school officials would descend upon the area in daylight to examine the site and would allegedly find two sturdy concrete posts that had been pushed over by some powerful force, as well as a ring pattern etched into the ground nearby. Authorities of the Civil Aviation Bureau of Transportation Ministry would later get wind of the story and dismiss the lights as merely from normal aircraft in the area. No word on what they thought the fanged humanoid could have been. Another account from the same area was related to me that seems to involve some sort of gnome-like creatures that are really hard to classify. The witness says that this happened in the summer of 2011 out in the wilds of Yamanashi Prefecture. The man claims that he'd been hiking out along a remote trail in the middle of nowhere when he heard what sounded like singing coming from somewhere up ahead. It seemed odd, as this was a rarely used trail and he had not passed anyone or seen anyone out all day. 
He stood and listened, and the ethereal singing continued, the voices high-pitched like those of children. Curious, the witness continued on his path, and the singing got louder, and he slowed down and quietly approached what seemed to be the source, which was a forest clearing up ahead. As he peeked through the brush into the clearing, he could now see the origins of the singing, which were no children. He explained that there were seven to ten tiny beings in the clearing, measuring only about two or three feet in height, and wearing what looked like some sort of white robes. The faces seemed to be a bright red in color, and they were all dancing about and singing in some language the man could not understand. Most bizarrely of all, they were making huge, lofty bounds about the clearing, gracefully arching up into the air to come floating down as if they were defying gravity somehow. The witness claims that at some point they realized they were being watched and abruptly stopped their singing, dancing, and bounding about. At this point, they all turned in unison and stared at the intruder, and he could see that their red faces held smallish, beady black eyes, large noses, and that they had tiny mouths without expression. For a moment, they merely stared at each other, and the witness said he could feel a certain feeling of dread and foreboding, as if he was not supposed to be there, and described the sense he got from the entities as somewhat malevolent. Then, without a sound, the creatures suddenly and silently dispersed into the surrounding forest, totally without sound and without so much as a snap of a twig or rustle of branches. It's a confounding report that defies any easy classification, and one wonders just what in the world these entities could have possibly been. This sense of bafflement is a common thread running through all of these reports, and we're left to speculate of what the nature of any of these perplexing beings could have been. Considering their unearthly humanoid nature, it seems unlikely that any of these things could have been any sort of undiscovered cryptid in the wilds of Japan. Could they have been spirits of some sort? Were they visitors from another world? One possibility is that they could have been visitors from some other dimension, so-called ultra-terrestrials, who have for whatever reason managed to somehow punch through into our reality. Is that what these were? It is curious to note that in some cases the creatures have seemed to be just as surprised as the witnesses, as if they are baffled as to how they could be seen. What possible significance does this have, if any? These are questions we're likely to be left without the answers to, and these reports serve to merely add to the very bizarre literature on strange humanoid sightings reported from all over the world. Up next, most news reporters would relish the opportunity to cover the story of a flying saucer sighting, but one case in 1987 left one radio newsman wishing he had never heard of the letters UFO. When Weird Darkness Returns While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, 
Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage, his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Reports of men in black date back to at least the 1940s. Described as dressing in all black suits and black hats, these shadowy figures are said to deliver veiled threats to those who dare to discuss publicly the existence of UFOs and aliens. Who they are is a mystery, with speculation ranging from government-backed agencies charged with keeping extraterrestrial secrets out of the hands of ordinary citizens to extraterrestrials themselves, intent on observing those with connections to alien activity. In early October 1987, Danny Gordon, a radio journalist for the country music station WYVE, heard a local report of an unidentified flying object in his hometown of Wytheville, Virginia. The news came from the sheriff's department and stated that four police officers, three of whom were sheriff's deputies and former military men, had witnessed a strange object in the sky the previous night. Being a very skeptical newsman, Danny decided to report the story as a ha-ha piece, something to conclude his news segment on a light-hearted note. What he could not have anticipated was the response from his listeners. Reports of similar UFO sightings flooded in, so much so that Danny set up a special call-in program for the following week. Discussing the call-in program on the 25th anniversary of the sightings, Danny Gordon described it as a lightning rod moment. After that, every day, the phone would ring off the hook. The people of Wytheville had not only witnessed similar sky anomalies as the police officers, but were willing to share what they had seen. Well, it kind of looks something about like an egg shape to me, said one caller. What we could see was red, green, and white, sort of flashing lights. We saw a plane go by with, you know, red, red flashing lights. We know it wasn't a jet of any sort," said another caller. Determined that there was a rational explanation for these strange sightings, such as an experimental military aircraft, Danny felt the situation would resolve itself in time, and the sightings would ebb away. He was wrong local residents continued to witness strange lights in the sky with their suspicions raised when rumors spread about town that the local military had unconvincingly explained the sightings as planes simply refueling mid-air above residents' houses. To help clarify the situation, Danny states that he called the Pentagon and talked to the Air Force general there who told him that under no circumstances would refueling occur under 13,000 feet and that the reported sightings of strange lights and aircraft, which were spotted no more than 5,000 feet above the ground, were simply not the U.S. Air Force. With the sightings still unexplained, Danny and his friend Roger Hall decided to investigate further. They headed out to the location of one of the sighting hotspots one evening. After a fruitless search, on their return to town about a quarter to nine, they saw a very unusual object coming across the horizon. Alarmed, Danny stopped the car and both men jumped out. 
In a later interview, Danny described seeing a craft which was very large. It had a dome-shaped top and no wings. It had a dome-shaped top and no wings and what it appeared to be a strobe putting out multicolored lights on the right side. Roger Hall stated that the object was probably less than a thousand feet away and a thousand feet high at the maximum. We guessed it at being at least two football fields in diameter, said Roger Hall. You could see three huge looked like picture windows in the back of it that were lit from the inside out. Danny Gordon said, as I watched the sky, from the left came a red ball. As a big mothership went into a small skip of clouds, the red ball docked with the craft. Dumbstruck by what they were witnessing, neither man was able to photograph the object, despite having gone out that night armed with cameras. The following evening, the men went out again, and this time managed to photograph the anomaly. When they were developed, they only showed vague streaks of light in the sky. Ready to share his findings with his audience, Danny arranged a press conference. The night before, he received a phone call from somebody who refused to identify himself. Eerily, the stranger warned Danny that the CIA and the federal government were very much interested in Wythe County UFOs and that it was something that he needed to leave alone because it was not his place to be messing in defense matters. The following night, after the press conference, Danny returned home to discover his house had been broken into. Nothing was missing, however. It seemed as though someone, whoever had broken in, had been searching for something. I started to wonder what I'd stepped into, and my wife was urging me to back off, to leave it alone, Danny said. Far from being over, reports of UFOs continued to flood Wythe County. Six weeks after the press conference, Danny Gordon caught sight of strange objects in the sky for a third time. He, his wife and daughter, were leaving the shopping center when everyone in the area stopped to look up. Danny recalls a group of schoolchildren pointing and shouting at the sky. Supposedly, there were four different aircraft flying in formation that made no sound. According to Danny's estimates, there were 200 people who watched them fly over. Once again, Danny was able to photograph the crafts in four separate shots. We looked very quickly and saw what I thought was a large object which later appeared to be four flying disc shapes. As soon as the objects were photographed, they disappeared from view. When the pictures came out, they had a lot of grain, but they showed definite four shapes of objects in the sky. But the most impressive point, in the four photographs, the objects appeared to change shape or light formations within one click of the camera. They go from a teardrop shape to a round ball shape, then they go to a flying saucer-like disc shape, and then they go to an egg shape as they go out of sight, Danny Gordon said in an interview. Three months after the initial sightings, and Wythe County now had more than 1,500 reports of UFOs. Something was clearly going on. Danny once again phoned the Pentagon and pushed for answers. The response he allegedly received was shocking. Speaking with the spokesman for defense at the Pentagon, he was told, we do not deny UFOs exist. The government confirms they exist, but we deny they pose a threat to the populace of Wythe County. When Danny asked how the spokesman could know such a thing, he was bluntly told that no further information could be given. Danny continued to investigate the UFOs which plagued Wythe County. However, one night after receiving yet another strange phone call, he began to wonder if he was making the right decision. He claims to have been contacted by a retired military intelligence officer who asked Danny to record their conversation so that if anything happened to him, it was on record that he had been forewarned. The man told Danny that he too had been researching UFOs to a tragic end. What I'm tell you, Danny, he said, is I've been pursuing this thing for many, many years, and like I said, I saw my son die of leukemia. The man claimed that because of his research, his son had been targeted. What I'm telling you, he continued, is they'll try to hit you if they think it's advisable for their purposes to keep you from further investigating this thing, and then most likely it'd be done through skin contact chemicals. It'd be something on the doorknob of your car or on the steering wheel. They could also come up with something or do something to your children. Segments from the original tape conversation 
were publicly broadcast during an episode of NBC's Unsolved Mysteries. Understandably, the conversation left Danny chilled. Regardless, he felt he needed to continue his research and uncover the truth behind the mass UFO sightings. Less than a month later, two strange men in black arrived at his home, supposedly journalists wishing to write an article about Danny and the UFO for their newspaper. The men stayed for about 45 minutes, one interviewing Danny and the other wandering around the house taking photos. As they left, they said they would send Danny a copy of the article when it was published. When it did not arrive, Danny contacted the newspaper they claimed to work for. However, it had no record of the journalists stating that the two men did not work for them. So who they were, I don't know, but they were in my house, Danny said, saw my pictures, saw my negatives, talked to my family, took pictures, and then left, and they were not with the newspaper. It was some time after this meeting that Danny realized the negatives of the photos he had taken outside the shopping center were missing. Someone had taken the original images of the four UFO photographs. I felt like maybe there was something in those photographs that I was not seeing, he said, so I took the photographs to some other people to look at. We used magnifying glasses, we measured angles, trying to find out why these photographs were so important, and we're yet to discover why anyone would want to steal that one specific set of four in a series of photographs of UFOs. By now, Danny was living alone. His wife and daughter had moved out, exhausted and living in fear of what may happen to them as Danny continued his research. Two months later, Danny had a stress-induced heart attack. He had to stop his investigation. By the time he left Wythe County, he had collected 3,000 sightings from telephone calls and conversations with people in the street. Speaking years later, Danny spoke of his regrets in how he handled the case. If I had the choice, he said, I'd not report the UFO story again. It's just been too hard on my life and created too many problems. When Weird Darkness returns, a weirdo family member shares her story of some creepy sensations. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. When I got married 24 years ago, my husband and I bought a small three-bedroom apartment. We loved it and redecorated it with our own hands. Our two children grew up in that apartment, and we spent many happy days there until we moved after my husband got a job overseas. But even now, many years later, I can't help but think that we were not alone in that apartment. You see, I always had a very strong sensation that someone was with us there watching us. I tried to check about the former residence, but with no result and since this presence didn't disturb or harm us, I went along with my life. A few years after we moved into the apartment, a young couple bought the apartment above ours. They were an established duo and they decided to do a huge makeover to their apartment in plans to raise a family there. The renovation work took a couple of months. I was invited to see the results and it looked beautiful. A few weeks later, I ran into my new neighbor. 
he looked distracted and somewhat angry. Hi, neighbor, I called him, and he answered, well, unfortunately, not everyone. Why? I said. You just finished the work on the apartment. To which he answered almost apologetically, my wife left and went to her mother. She says she won't spend one night in this apartment since it's haunted. So what was there in our building? Did I and my neighbor's wife both imagine it, or was there something there visiting us uninvited? Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast and you haven't already subscribed, be sure to do so now so you don't miss future episodes. And also, please tell someone else about the podcast. Recommend Weird Darkness to your friends, family, and co-workers who love the paranormal, horror stories, or true crime like you do. Every time you share the podcast with someone new, it helps spread the word about the show, and a growing audience makes it possible for me to keep creating episodes as often as I do. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Fact or fiction, you can click on Tell Your Story on the website and I might use it in a future episode. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Creepy Humanoids in Japan was written by Brent Swanser for Mysterious Universe. The Wytheville UFOs and Men in Black is from Paranormal Scholar. We Were Not Alone was submitted anonymously to WeirdDarkness.com. The Disappearance of the Amber Room was written by Jim H. for Historic Mysteries. Aliens Invade Kelly, Kentucky is by Billy Booth for Live About. A Vampire's DNA Test is by Michael E. Ruane for Science Alert. The Child in My Bedroom Doorway is by Weirdo Family Member Rita Gomez. Creature with Glowing Eyes Terrorizes Shoppers is by Amma Raymond for Sama TV. And The Delaware Avenue Slaying is from Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 27 verse 1 The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And a final thought, the only way to achieve the impossible is to believe it is possible. Charles Kingsley I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.